Well, thank you very much. Um, I will get this joke over and done with so that nobody else has to. It's very nice to see you all here in Nice. Thank you very much. Now nobody else needs to do that, so that's all okay. Genuinely, I find this conference a really fascinating one, and I'm very grateful to have been asked to come right around the world uh, to be here um, uh, today. This is where I live now, uh, in uh, sunny Brisbane, and that's a photograph of my radio there, because I thought that you might w want to see what, a, what an Australian radio looks like. Now, I think one of the things that I've discovered about the radio industry is that we all think we know what's happening. But it actually takes good research to tell us what's really going on. And sometimes our hunches and our research are usually quite different. Uh, as one example, radio is um, apparently uh, dead. Um, something, and I don't know what it is, has killed radio. Uh, it might be video. Uh, it might be advertising that's killed the radio star. Uh, Spotify, maybe, or quotas. Uh, or Vine, do you remember that? Vine, uh, or, or weirdly Norway. Um, or is the answer that nothing's killed radio? Because no matter who works out the figures, no matter how we work them out, they all rather pleasingly arrive back at the same kind of number. Nine out of 10 of us listen to radio uh, every uh, single week. So I'm James Cridland, the radio futurologist, uh, as you've uh, heard, or uh, if, if you were at an Australian conference that I was at recently, a so-called radio futurologist, uh, which was uh, always nice to hear. Um, much of what I do now is to show fancy graphs and numbers showing how radio is changing across the world. Um, and those fancy graphs and numbers normally I shamelessly steal from you guys. Um, here's one of my favorites. Um, this is normally accompanied by a fancy animation, but uh, many people talk about radio, uh, radio's future being poor because uh, the amount of uh, listening to radio from young people uh, is much smaller than, uh, than everybody else. But of course, the bigger picture is that young people use all media less, and in proportion, their radio consumption is actually much the same uh, as anybody else. I like this graph, it's nice. But today I'm going to avoid using any more graphs um, because, well, I'll, I'll, I'll show you one more uh, chart diagram. Um, it's just a hunch, but I think you might see a few more graphs today. Um, so, uh, so I'm going to try and avoid those. And anyway, you're all marking my work as well because I'm not a researcher. Um, today's theme then is around the sound of the crowd. And radio is getting much more crowded. Firstly, it's much easier to produce radio. Back in the 1970s, when commercial radio in the UK was just starting up, studios would be incredibly expensive. Uh, because having a large studio complex costing millions of euro was the only way to make great radio. But here we are in 2017, this is a radio station, it's got tens of thousands of people tuning into it, and it comes from someone's attic. Um, the attic of a man called Chris. Uh, literally, no studios, nothing. It's a valued radio station, it's on DAB, it's proper radio. Um, doesn't even have a radio studio, doesn't even, uh, it doesn't even have to compete for a license either. Here's another example of where we've uh, come from. Does anybody recognize these? Anyone? Yes, one person, there you go. Uh, when, when I learnt to do radio and to edit, uh, as many of you will have done, I learnt to edit with reel-to-reel -reel and China Graph pencil and splicing tape. Then came Sadie, one of the first multi-track editors on a computer. I remember my training uh, to use uh, Sadie. Interestingly, the, the English word fish looks like fish when you see it on a, on a, on a screen, which is a, a, an interesting thing. But Sadie needed a very high-quality computer. It needed very expensive sound cards. But for the first time, you could edit audio on a computer. Then came Audacity. Now here's where we are now. Anyone can download this free program on your own laptop and edit multi-track radio shows like this one. This is a very good radio show which happens to get broadcast in three places uh, in the UK. Now, editing like this is what Anchor thought about doing. Anchor is an app. It allows you to podcast. 
And they thought about that type of user interface to allow you to trim audio on a mobile phone using a waveform like we've just seen with Audacity or with Sadie. But they've realized that this could be even easier because instead of using a waveform, you trim the audio by literally pointing at the word you want to start at and the word you want to finish at. And that's how you use the Anchor app to trim audio. The BBC, well, they've gone one step further because they would, wouldn't they? Uh, they have their own editing tool called Discourse. And Discourse makes producing an interview and editing an interview as easy as using a word processor. You just highlight what you want to edit and the software goes away and does the audio editing for you. It's brilliant. There again, some radio producers can't be bothered with all this and would rather go to the pub. So therefore, the BBC have built something for them too, brilliantly. Um, this is a way to edit audio and video. And what you do is you print out the script, you go to the pub, genuinely, with your pen, and you cross off the bits that you want to edit out, go back to the studio afterwards, after having, you know, a couple of pints, um, scan in the pieces of paper or plug in the pen in this particular case, and the system makes the edits for you automatically. Now, obviously, this is all just R&D work at the moment, so you can't obviously edit audio quite yet by using a word processor, except you can. This is a product called Sonics, which you can um, use right now online, uh, and it edits audio, again, simply by highlighting it in your word processor and editing away the words. No one needs to be an awesome audio editor anymore, theoretically. A lot of the specialism here has gone. So the way that we make radio is changing dramatically quickly. It allows us time to create great content rather than fiddle with the technology. And we're not actually the only industry with this enormous change. Hands up who has sold a house recently. Has anyone sold a house recently? You're all very lucky if you haven't sold a house recently. It's not fun selling a house. This is how you used to sell a house. Um, you used to get the real estate agent to come out and take a photograph, which was then stuck out onto, uh, uh, stuck onto a piece of paper, uh, as you can see there. This is, by the way, this was my first house that I bought. Um, and then other people would have to go to the estate agent's office and look at what houses were for sale by picking up these little leaflets. Um, now, let me show you how it's done in 2017. Now, obviously, it's online. Uh, it's on Facebook. This is perfectly targeted because this is an ad for a house that was on sale in the next street to the street where I live in Australia. Um, it appeared in my timeline. Facebook knows that I have kids. And so you won't be able to read the text, but it says, your kids will love you even more. Because it knows that I have kids, and as you'll see from the video, it's a tremendous place for kids. Just have a look at how they're selling houses now. Ben, it's Daniel Lee. You know how you're looking for that perfect family home in Baden? I've got it for you, mate. It's all ready to go. Your wife's gonna love it. And there's heaps of room for the kids. You gotta come and have a look this weekend. Hang on, I'll call you back. Oh no, the kids. Guys, don't mess up the place. This gorgeous home on a corner block has a simple floor plan. All on one level with heaps of areas to entertain. I know you're on a road. Sweet honey. Let's take it real soon. This entertaining area is so cool. The kids have their own playground, but guys, try not to mess it up. Imagine if you lifted this house up, you'd get full city views. What potential. Guys, honestly, be careful. We have an open home this Saturday and this place has to look spotless. The house? Yeah, it's perfect. The kids? Hopefully they're grounded. You know the spiel. I'll see you at the open home.
Now, I have to say, when you see that in comparison to a folded in half photocopied piece of paper, you realize quite how far that we've come. We've come from a time where only the privileged few can make media to a world where even real estate agent Daniel can make a nice video for a house around the corner, by the way, which isn't actually a very nice house, um, but just a, a house just around the corner from mine. It's a very crowded world. And because everyone can make great content, and because it's much easier to get it out there, that of course means that there's lots more great content to tune into. So, as we've just heard, people in Norway, um, because they've switched off FM and they've turned off uh, and they've turned on DAB, people in Norway have moved from having just five national radio stations to 35. Massive change. Brisbane, my home city, from 18 radio stations or so up to 52 with a DAB radio. London, I believe. Uh, has somewhere in the region of 170 different radio stations. And of course we have the internet as well, piping hundreds of thousands of radio stations across the world to anyone who wants them. And at the same time that we're vastly expanding the amount of stations, research budgets, well they're frozen, they may be going down while costs go up, and smaller sample sizes are colliding with harder to reach consumer segments. So if we're not careful, newer, more innovative radio will have poorer research as a result because the research might not be able to keep up with the innovation on the air. Niche broadcasters means that numbers for individual stations are actually much smaller than they've ever been. This is a brand new radio station in London. It's called Fix Radio. It's on DAB and it's aimed at tradesmen. So it's aimed at decorators and roofers and plumbers. 25-year-old um, hard-working men who work in a different place every single week who probably don't want to wear fragile pieces of electronics and probably don't want to fill in a diary or answer telephone calls. Good luck in getting some research uh, from the audience of this lot. Mind you, at least this radio station is permanent because we can also launch temporary radio stations now as well. Um, it's really easy to do on DAB and new platforms, so many do, from Christmas radio stations to radio stations just playing summer songs, um, to Magic ABBA, which is a radio station for people who can't hear, because my goodness, that would drive you deaf, wouldn't it? Um, to a radio station there celebrating um, the, uh, the anniversary um, of uh, a radio station launch. Now, brand consolidation helps these radio stations market themselves, because I know roughly what these stations are going to be, because I've heard these stations the master brands, uh, if you like. But of course, this adds significant brand recall issues. W was I listening to Smooth Christmas, or was I listening to a Christmas song on Smooth Radio? Was I tuned into an oldies show on Radio 1, or was it Radio 1 Vintage? And are the sample sizes really there for a radio station that only lasts one month, or even one weekend? Devices are changing our radio consumption too. You'll hear more from uh, Mark and Michael about smart speakers. This is not the research that they'll be talking about, but as you can probably see, the story is good for radio. But on mobile, on-demand rules, probably because we're tethered to our devices by a headphone cable or by Bluetooth connection. We're consuming much more on-demand content than we ever have, um, and much more on-demand content than live. We'll hear more about on-demand uh, content soon from uh, Alison Winter from the BBC. But we do know that on-demand skews younger than typical radio, and particularly including podcasting. It's a growing element of audio consumption and increasingly attractive to advertisers. And there's more. Australian research from their radio app shows that people switch more in a car with Apple CarPlay than if they're wearing headphones. So more technology means the research job becomes harder still. More people are involved in radio these days, and more people have a voice thanks to social media. And I think that those of us in this room probably have a responsibility to explain how our radio research works, um, why it's actually good and trustworthy, and why it's the most pragmatic choice for our market. And very often, you'll find people are bad-mouthing audience research, or are ignorant about how the audience figures uh, work. Let me show you one example. The new Rajar figures came out uh, a couple of weeks ago um, in the UK. 
Um, there was a piece about Radio 1's uh, audience figures falling uh, in the press. Um, and uh, so uh, Christian Ward here uh, linked to it and said, what's the point of the Rajars if they don't take online or apps into account? Now, I saw this tweet, and I decided to respond with a witty and accurate rejoinder, reflecting my 28 years uh, in this business, and I said, they do. <laughs> Christian saw my response, and he drew himself up, and he hit the reply button and flexed his fingers and said, all right. Still, it's not as if Christian Ward is a head of media and marketing uh, and a journalist, is it? And at least he didn't used to work for the BBC and an internet radio So, Oh, wait, he did, uh, which is slightly scary. But mind you, at least he hasn't used a photograph of himself wearing silly fluffy cat ears for his online photograph. Oh, oh wait, he has. Um, and what on earth am I doing this for, anyway? So, maybe in conclusion, we might think uh, about a few things. Um, First, I'm just curious, how many people work in programming here? Mm. I think it would be nice to have a few more hands uh, going up. So maybe one of the, the, those ideas is to get more people from programming here to understand your world and their world better. Um, they might, you know, find more budget uh, if they understand that world a little bit more. Secondly, yeah, of course, it would be great if we had more people here, but I think that genuinely we also need to go to them too. Um, talk to people within the industry about radio research uh, is always a good plan. Now, the UK's DAB industry has finally cottoned on that actually it's a good idea to go round to radio stations talking to them about DAB. Um, this is uh, an event that they're doing in a couple of weeks' time, which uh, I would go to if I were you, uh, at the Belfast Media Festival. And they've been doing these events uh, in regional parts of the UK uh, over the last couple of years. I think there's a role here for radio research, too, to talk to people who make radio, as well as talk to senior management, of course. Actually, this stuff really is fascinating to people who work in the industry, particularly those in more junior uh, positions, too. So get out to the industry and talk. Explain how it works, explain what you do and what's possible, um, and try and get uh, talking in some more uh, radio conferences too. Um, and thirdly, I would just ask, um, from a personal point of view, to, to just consider how you focus on your online presence for your figures uh, as well. Those figures that you make freely available. The reason why I've grabbed a lot of data from uh, the UK isn't because, just because I'm a lazy Englishman, although obviously I am a lazy Englishman. Um, it's also because I would say that Rajar, now having seen lots of them, Rajar is probably the world leader in releasing data in many different ways on their website. You can download uh, data here um, in XLS format, in CSV format. You can download uh, it in all kinds of different uh, formats and different ways. Great data that tells radio's story really does need to be available to everybody, particularly if that data is already uh, freely uh, available in some way online. Um, Commercial Radio Australia also does uh, some good things too in presenting stories. They use um, nice clear infographics. Um, this is the Australian's uh, share of audio uh, research, uh, showing, as you can see, that uh, two-thirds of our audio time is spent with live Australian radio, which is nice. Um, here's some more stuff about um, uh, summer, which we're just about to move into uh, in Australia, showing that uh, radio uh, is surprisingly much more popular than anything else you could possibly advertise on uh, in uh, summer. Um, if, uh, you know, from my point of view, I think that these are really helpful in telling radio's uh, story. So if you have uh, relationships with uh, research companies, maybe build an online, a better online presence uh, into their next uh, contract. But unlike many areas of the press, I think that there's a lot of innovation uh, in radio. But I think it needs its storytelling. And the people in this room are the ones who can continue telling radio's story for many years to come. So I wish you a really good radio conference today. Uh, please tell me your stories. Those are my uh, contact details. And I look forward to learning and sharing radio's next story uh, with you. Thank you for your time this morning. Thanks.